Um, this session is all about Stronger Together, the importance of international scientific collaboration during and after a pandemic. And of course, COVID-19 has had a massive impact on Australia and the world, both in terms of the health impact themselves, but of course on the wider economy and society. But I'm heartened by the fact that science has come to the fore. Scientific evidence has informed almost all aspects of the response to the pandemic, vaccine development, public health measures, mitigating health impacts, and the supporting the production of essential health supplies, such as masks, tests, and ventilators. And of course, international collaboration has been fundamental to all of this work. I'm on my way to becoming the counsellor for the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources in Europe. And that's part of the reason Dr Cook asked me to step in for him to moderate this session. But in my former role as Chief of Staff to Australia's current Chief Scientist, Dr Alan Finkel, I've seen this international collaboration firsthand. Chief Scientific Advisors from countries around the world came together to discuss how science and research could maximise its contribution to the global response to COVID-19. The group was convened by Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, Dr. Kelvin Drogelmeyer, and was regularly attended by Commissioner Gabrielle from the European Commission and many other CSAs from across Europe. I'm particularly proud of the work this group did to champion open access to COVID publications and COVID-19 publications data and, and data worldwide. So using all of that scientific evidence to support local decision makers was another challenge, a challenge in Australia that we addressed in part through the Rapid Research Information Forum. The, Dr Finkel convened this forum at the height of the crisis and was supported by the Australian academic community and led by the Academy of Science. And I hope Professor Shine will talk a bit about that work when he gets his chance to speak. And of course, you're not here to hear from me, you're here to hear from the panelists, so let's hear from them. So I'll start by introducing each of the speakers. So, and then each of them will have a kind of five minute chance to, to talk about their reflections about the importance of international scientific collaboration and the impacts COVID has had. So I'll start with Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, President of the European Research Council. Do you want to give us your reflections on, on these um, challenging times? Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity of uh, saying what uh, the European Research Council um, uh, is uh, doing or has been doing and will be doing uh, concerning uh, this issue. So maybe uh, just a few, a few words for those of you who may not know exactly what the European Research Council is. So it's uh, one um, component of uh, the framework program of the European Commission. So the present one, which is uh, very finishing uh, at the end of uh, 2020, is Horizon 2020. And the next one is be, will be called Horizon Europe. And in the case of uh, the ERC, European Research Council, its um, structure is going to be basically untouched. So we will continue to distribute grants to individual researchers, but also uh, through a program I'm going to mention in, in a minute, also to groups of uh, two, three or four researchers. The idea is really to challenge the researchers to come up with their most ambitious ideas. The number of grants we have been giving uh, so far is about 10,000, and uh, the number of people employed with this was about 60 to 70,000 people. And in particular, a lot of emphasis is put on younger people, and, uh, and because two thirds of our grants are going to people below the age of 40. So now concerning international collaboration, first of all, the ERC is completely open to uh, people from any nationality. Um, and actually we do have a, a number of uh, participants. I just checked in the case of Australia and New Zealand, the number of applications of uh, Australians uh, was about 500 in the, since the creation of the ERC in 2007. And the case of uh, in the case of uh, New Zealand, the number was, uh, of course, smaller because the country is smaller, about uh, 120. And um, the successful ones, because uh, and the, both countries have been uh, more successful than the average uh, European uh, um, nationals, in a sense, uh, it was uh, about uh, actually 15% uh, success rate of these people. Almost all of them were actually located in uh, Europe when they applied. So in a sense, uh, their nationality is definitely Australian or New Zealander, but they are not uh, located there. But there is one, uh, so there are two elements I want to bring up in terms of uh, international collaborations. One of them is a new move, which was uh, decided by the Scientific Council of ERC, which has the responsibility of uh, defining the program. 
which was uh, for the uh, Synergy Grant, which I mentioned are supporting um, projects submitted by groups of two, three, or four researchers. The possibility since two years now that one of the two, three, four could be located completely outside Europe and without requesting from the country where the person lives um, to, to provide money. Of course, if the money, the country wants to provide money, it's welcome, but it's not in a, a condition. And the very good news is that this year, I mean, and we just gave the result for uh, Synergy Grants uh, 2020, uh, actually about, uh, we, we gave 34 of these grants, which are quite big, 10 million euro for six years. Um, and uh, we, this year we gave uh, 34 of these grants and uh, um, a significant number, about 20%, uh, do contain a person from outside. And from the people from outside, one is from Australia. So I'm very pleased that this uh, possibility that we open actually um, proved to be um, really a way of uh, doing collaboration. The other dimension is what we call our implementing arrangement, which uh, is agreements we sign with Australian uh, agencies to make it possible for Australian scientists to visit researchers in, uh, in uh, the ERC teams. And, and then for says which are completely agreed between the researchers. So this is not a top-down approach. The philosophy of VRC is fully bottom-up. One word, if you allow me, on the COVID. Actually, as you know, the ERC is really looking for frontier research. So one thing which was very interesting for us to prove that our concept is uh, workable, also in the case of uh, crisis, like the one we are facing, was the fact that uh, we looked into uh, our portfolio when the crisis uh, appeared and to see whether we have, we had, we have actually um, projects which are relevant for the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And actually the not surprise, but I think the good news is that uh, the number of projects uh, which were really relevant and with the after so analysis was about 160 projects represented more than 300 million euros. So a very significant number, and some of them are really fantastically pertinent because presently two of the most promising uh, vaccines uh, in uh, the one uh, which is uh, connected to the company BioNTech and uh, which connected with Pfizer and the other one with this, uh, the one in Oxford for AstraZeneca, the two key people in the two projects are ERC grantees and their grants were directly connected to the concept of the vaccine they have been developing. So this is just one more proof. You said that, of course, science has been uh, very much in the, in, the, in the light because of the crisis, but actually our, the concept of looking for long-term research and frontier research, I think, um, needs to be defended because at the moment, many people in the political world are completely obsessed for reasons I fully understand by the in, uh, necessity of taking immediate measures, but actually one, one needs to keep a long view. That's fundamental. In the case of the Europe, you know that we have our seven-year uh, framework program. So if you build the seven-year uh, framework program only thinking of the first two years, it's wrong. Wonderful, thank you. I agree completely in terms of the, um, and of course, you know, we wouldn't have had these benefits if we hadn't had that long run investment and we wouldn't have been able to pivot so quickly to addressing this pandemic. Now I'll move on to Professor John Shine, who is president of the Australian Academy of Science. What's your kind of five minute reflection on what's happened so far and how COVID has impacted? Sorry, I'm, I think I'm now there. <laughs> yep, I can hear you now. Thank you very much. It's a to join you. Look, we all know that uh, modern science is very much built on collaborations that surpass national borders. And that's especially in the pursuit of innovative solutions to many of the pressing global challenges. So the worldwide research effort in response to the COVID-19 challenge, I think has really demonstrated the the power of science to which international collaboration was indispensable. We've seen with this pandemic an unprecedented level of international scientific cooperation and goodwill to combat the, <coughs> to combat the impact of the virus on the world, uh, including, of course, working rapidly together to find vaccines. I think it just proves again that science has time and again 
shown itself to be an effective and powerful soft power asset in playing an important role in building strategic partnerships between countries. I suppose for me, Sarah, one of the most striking examples of the importance of international collaborations during the pandemic was the collaboration between Professor Eddie Holmes, who's a leading virologist with expertise in SARS-CoV-2, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and working at the University of Sydney, together with his colleague, Professor Yong Zhen Zhang at Funan University in China. Now, both Professors Holmes and Zhang were part of the team that first mapped the virus's genome back in January. And they both decided to publish the genome sequence as soon as possible, so the whole world could rapidly have access to it and start to work on diagnostics and vaccines. A great example of that international collaboration. I mean, there's many other examples of uh, fruitful collaborations around the globe. During the pandemic has been the work of the Inter-Academy Partnership, which is an organization of more than 140 World Academies of Science. The Inter-Academy Inter Partnership did launch a COVID-19 expert group. This was charged with responding to inquiries related to the pandemic across a broad range of health, social and environmental issues. So academies of science all over the globe have been playing their own part in national and regional initiatives, helping to ensure trustworthy and credible information is reaching as many people as possible. Importantly, of course, in all the local languages. And academies have responded in, in probably four major ways. They've been providing evidence-based advice to governments. They've been establishing expert databases. They've been conducting public outreach to inform the public about the development of COVID-19 and ways to uh, mitigate it. They've also been sharing data and experiences. And one example of which you alluded to earlier, uh, uh, shown in the providing scientific evidence to support decision-making in Australia, has been a thing called the Rapid Research Information Forum, or RIF that was established to respond to questions posed by Australian government ministers. Now, RIF provides a mechanism to share rapidly the most current and the relevant research with Australia's decision makers so that we could accurately inform their policy practices. As you mentioned, it was convened by Australia's chief scientist and its operations are led by the Australian Academy of Science. But importantly, very importantly, this has been in collaboration with Australia's other learned academies, social sciences, medicine, technology, and the humanities. Because a challenge such as COVID-19 goes across all aspects of human endeavor, not just some of the hard sciences. I mean, other major pandemic related activities conduct, conducted this year, of course, have also been those by the International Science Council, which is a non-government organization representing both the natural and the social sciences, with a global membership of more than 40 international scientific uni unions and interdisciplinary science bodies, as well as over 140 national and regional scientific bodies. The vision of that council really is that science is a global public good and recognizing the pivotal role that international scientific collaboration plays during this global crisis it has hi highlighted multiple initiatives to encourage members and partners across the globe to collaborate and share best practices. I should also mention though that mobilizing the knowledge and resources of the council's broad scientific community and combining it with the sophisticated science communication tools developed by the Australian Academy of Science, the council and the academy have jointly produced something called Global Science TV. Now, Global Science TV convenes scientific experts as it presents informative videos on COVID-19 and other pressing scientific events of our time. This is so important today. As we all know, the internet and social media is, is a powerful uh, communication tool. It's a great opportunity to get the right information out, to get factual information out to the general public. Because unfortunately, the flip side of, of those technologies it does provide a platform for minor, minor sort of fringe groups to present non-factual data or to cherry pick particular bits of scientific data to suit their particular agenda. So there's such an important role that we as scientists in the academies uh, 
need to present uh, as a sort of legitimate factual source for some of the science behind these challenges. Science and the work of researchers, of course, uh, are crucial to responding to and recovering from pandemics. And this is applicable, as we've seen in, th in this instance, to both the immediate and the long-term recovery process. We've already seen this initially with the extremely rapid development of accurate diagnostic tests, which allowed us to manage the pan pandemic, and now to the successful development of several effective vaccines. The challenge now, of course, is their rapid and equitable distribution. I mean, there's no doubt that infectious disease, new infectious diseases will continue to evolve and challenge us. We'll never win the complete war against infectious disease. But with the technologies now, and especially the international scientific collaboration using those technologies, we, win, we will win the battles and they'll be, that victory, those victories will be much shorter and more decisive. And I think we're seeing that now with the, as we begin to come out of a pandemic, although there's still some way to go. So the work of science, of course, uh, extends to responding to other global challenges, natural disasters like adverse weather events, certainly in Australia, the fires, which are becoming more intense and frequent due to global warming. And our combined knowledge and efforts are already required to respond to this adequately and respond importantly in a timely way. The science, as we all know, uh, Sarah, has become more and more, <coughs> more and more complex. And today, no single scientist can understand all and no institutions can afford all the facilities required to do all the leading edge science. And no single country alone can address the big scientific challenges of our time, including pandemics. I think, as we said at the beginning of the session, we are stronger together. And I think this pandemic, uh, despite all the challenges and despite the tragedy in many cases, has, has really been a great way of bringing together the international community. We've faced a common challenge. We've risen to that challenge. And hopefully overcoming that challenge will bring us all a lot closer uh, to future challenges. We are stronger together. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, John. I agree completely. Our next, our next speaker is Dr. Mary Kelly, Executive Director of Biological Sciences and Biotechnology at the Australian Research Council. Do you want to give us your reflections on the topic? Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you again for the invitation um, to such a great panel. Um, for our reflections, we've taken a little bit more of the individual's perspective. So we've looked at the researchers themselves within the research community. Um, and you know, my colleagues have spoken to many of the challenges that have been faced, but one of the things that we were conscious of from the very, very beginning is that it's every aspect of life. It's not just the, the research part of the professional part of people's lives, it's every aspect of their life. And so that's what we've thought about a little bit for the session today. Um, we know that like our colleagues overseas, the pandemic has created challenges for the researchers from managing research remotely um, from restricted access to research facilities, um, having caring responsibilities and becoming school teachers for our families at the same time that we're continuing to be researchers. Um, and, you know, the, as was spoken to in the previous session too, um, there's a growing level of uncertainty about what's next. So the Australian Research Council, we very much took that position that we're here for the hard part now, but we also need to be here um, after the pandemic or as we have evolved through what the pandemic has in store for us. Um, at the moment, we're talking about inability to travel, um, for example, for research purposes, but added to that is also um, challenges in accessing facilities. And some of that, as this previous speaker said, can be overcome when it's one-on-one -on -one or existing collaborations. But some of those challenges of new collaborations or access to key facilities can be quite difficult. Um, just in the last um, eight to nine months, and it's a different timeline for different groups, um, we have allowed extensions to grant submissions so that to try and minimize these adverse impacts. So with um, communication with the universities, we've allowed for grant application deadlines to be extended. Um, we haven't canceled any schemes and that actually is um, a credit to the research sector themselves. We have still managed to secure over 36,000 peer reviews this year, you know, irrespective of everything else that's going on. 
the research community is there to support the research community. Um, we have expanded, um, and this is again looking forward into the future, um, the criteria for career interruptions and research interruptions. Um, we've had those in our schemes, as do many um, funding agencies, but we've specifically added, as John referred to, natural disasters, but also um, the, in, the scenario that the pandemic has presented us all with. Um, two things I also, I just wanted to highlight um, for the audience, uh, potentially as future applicants or returning Australians um, seeking funding, um, we are specifically not asking our grant applicants to provide contingency plans because we do think that's quite premature. Um, they really don't know what the next six months, nine months, 12 months will bring. So we are focusing as we've always done on the excellence in the research, the mechanics of travel, and that can be managed after the awards are received. Um, so we're not looking for contingency plans and we're very carefully working with our peer reviewers not to make assumptions. Um, not to read a research proposal and say, well, I don't think he can do that in 2021. So ensuring that we put the excellence in research and keep the excellence in research as our priority um, and not try and predict the future. Because I think as others have said, we're not clear yet and we really don't know what's coming. Um, you had asked us too, Sarah, just to think a little bit about the positive impacts. Um, and from the Australian research perspective, we do fund research across all disciplines with the exception of clinical medical research. Um, and that means that we are seeing incredibly fast pivot and incredibly fast growth of applications that are looking at the STEM impacts and, and research topics around um, COVID-19, but also we're seeing a huge surge in applications around the social and behavioral impacts um, of the pandemic nationally and globally. Um, really exciting to see some proposals that are looking at the learnings at this point in time um, from the pandemic to potentially protect us in the future. Um, and also looking at policies and frameworks for the broader community, far beyond the research community. Um, we know that our researchers have been incredibly creative um, in how they've used technology to continue with their collaborations. But we are keeping a very um, careful watch with our universities um, on the impacts of current uh, PhD students and master's students, current postdocs. Um, again, to try and you know, be realistic about the impacts of the pandemic, but also to try and minimize the longer term effects to the best that we can. And, and I think finally, I mean, I've mentioned that the sector has been there to support the sector in terms of we still had the peer reviews. Um, if we had been asked 12 months ago, if we could run four day selection meetings with 200 academics online, um, we might have all laughed and left the building. But as it turns out, that's highly achievable and highly doable, um, but only because of the commitment from others. You know, we worked the mechanics. Um, and I think finally to, Coming back uh, to um, Jean-Pierre's point too about the longevity of funding support in one particular cohort, which is our centers of excellence that have five to seven years of funding, we have seen them so quickly be able to pivot and refocus using the intellectual capital that they have, which was never designed to be in response to a pandemic, but they have done that so quickly because that certainty is within the system. Um, so. From us, the reflections are about realities, but hats off to the many, many folk that have stood up to the challenges, um, have on collaborations, and we hope um, that some of these new emerging areas will also see a new, a new set of um, collaborations with our colleagues in Europe, of course, but globally, because I think everyone has, without a question, stepped up for the challenge. Thank, Thank you Sarah. so much, Mary. And I think you're exactly right in terms of the sector and the way it's pivoted, you know, in Australia and in New Zealand and around the world. You know, I think it really demonstrates that fundamental thing that I think people don't, sometimes they forget that, you know, people are in this to make a difference. They want their work to have real impact and to improve the lives of people around the world. And I think that, you know, like that can get lost sometimes in the, in the conversations. And I think it's, it's absolutely fundamental to the work of scientists and researchers around the world. 
All right, so now we'll move on to Professor Anne Kelso. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Australia's National Health and Medical Research Council. So we've had the non-medical funding side of the Australian system and now we move on to the medical side. Thank you so much, Anne. Thanks very much, Sarah, and hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about NHMRC's international connections to start with. Um, now, we were established uh, more than 80 years ago as the Australian government's health and medical research funding body. And I think it's uh, for very many years that we've recognised the importance of fostering Australian connection with international collaborators. And I think that really goes back to a time when international travel was almost as restricted as it is in 2020. Um, we see this today in a number of our policies for standard grant schemes. Our investigator grants for early career researchers allow the researcher to spend up to 50% of their time overseas for the five-year grant. And uh, it, for more senior researchers, it's 20%. Uh, researchers in overseas institutions can be co-investigators on our grants. And grant funds can be spent in another country if that's what's needed to achieve the goals of the project. At the moment, about 17% of our active grants uh, involve international collaborators and European scientists are uh, prominent in that list. Uh, NHMRC also has various co-funding arrangements with international funders and some of those are through multinational alliances such as the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases and eAsia. We're also members of the Human Frontier Science Program. But we also have a number of bilateral co-funding arrangements um, with uh, individual funding agencies in many countries around the world. Now, several of these collaborative grant schemes involve Europe, uh, and the two prominent ones of those are the NHMRC EU Collaborative Research Grant Scheme, which provides a contribution to Australian researchers who are part of teams with EU scientists supported by Horizon 2020, or of course in Future Horizon Europe. And we have a similar arrangement with the EU Joint Program on Neurodegenerative Disease Research, JPND. And uh, also NHMRC and the EC and a number of individual European countries are members of the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases and the Human Frontier Science Program. Um, now, we also have an implementing arrangement with the European Research Council, as Professor Bourguignon has just described, uh, and that enables uh, NHMRC-funded researchers to carry out research visits with ERC-supported European teams. And we were very pleased to discuss that arrangement with Professor Bourguignon when he visited us back in September uh, 2018, two years ago, but feels a lot longer, I think. Um, so we think these uh, multilateral and bilateral opportunities are a great way to foster direct collaboration in our fields of common interest. But of course, as others have already talked about, these collaborations build links between our countries at researcher level, but also at government level. And that all helps to create understanding and engagement in areas well beyond the projects that we fund. And I think we've seen that in this uh, pandemic this year and uh, all of the benefits of that. So just to say a few words about the pandemic, this has obviously had a huge impact across the research sector in Australia and elsewhere. And uh, I heard the end of the last session and I heard some of those issues being discussed, but others have raised them uh, as Mary has just now. Uh, for, for NHMRC, we've had three big issues we've wanted to tackle. Uh, how to support pandemic research, uh, how to manage our 2020 grant program during this uh, quite challenging year, and how to support the sector immediately and beyond the pandemic. And these are some of the uh, issues that uh, Mary has just canvassed and that were discussed in the previous session as well. I'm just going to comment on the first one now and how we've supported pandemic research. And this needs to go back a little bit because after the 2009 influenza pandemic, NHMRC reflected on its experience with rolling out urgent calls for research during an emergency like a pandemic and it's really difficult if you're not research ready. You lose a lot of precious time and that opportunity mean, it might mean you miss the opportunity to do the critical research that's needed to support the health response. So NHMRC decided some years ago to invest in pandemic research preparedness and we put out a competitive call for a single national collaborative research centre for that purpose. The successful applicant was a prize, the Australian Partnership for Preparedness Research in Infectious Disease Emergencies, and that's been funded from 2016 to next year. So really, as soon as it became clear how uh, important the global threat was likely to be from COVID-19 in 
it, from January, a prize got straight to work initiating a range of national and in some cases international projects on COVID-19 testing and clinical care, epidemiology, immunity and a number of other things. And I think the best example of that and one that's really relevant to our discussion today is REMAP-CAP. It's an international adaptive clinical trial. It's involving more than 200 sites globally. It's partly led by Australia, partly funded by NHMRC, and it's one of the a prize suite of projects. It was established several years ago, and it was able to switch very quickly to pandemic mode early in the year to test a range of potential therapies for severe COVID disease. And of course, with relatively few patients over the year in Australia, our participation in this kind of international collaborative trial has meant that we as a country have been able both to contribute to and to learn from uh, clinical experience in more severely affected countries. So just to wrap up these initial comments, I think that there have been uh, perhaps three really important lessons this year from, from what I've just told you. The first is that investment in pandemic preparedness research has paid off really well. Uh, and I think that's a message for us in thinking about uh, not only future pandemics, but future other sorts of threats. Second, uh, existing international collaborations have really come into their own because they've been able to pivot so quickly to respond to the emergency. It's very difficult to start these complex collaborations from scratch, even with uh, all of the will in the world that we've seen during this year. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, this largely successful Australian health response to the COVID-19 pandemic has benefited at every level from the long-term investments in research by NHMRC, the ARC and other funders. Many of the people we support are now advising government and we see them uh, in the media just about all the time. Uh, infectious diseases research has been a strength here for a long, long time in Australia. Uh, but I think that the broader impacts of the pandemic on society highlight the importance of many other fields, including the social and behavioural sciences, as Mary has already said, uh, and as John has said. So um, I expect that and hope that governments and the community will, invalu will value this type of investment uh, uh, as never before as a result of our experiences this year. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Anne. So now I'll move into the kind of more free-flowing discussion with some questions. And of course, one of the things we've all reflected on is the challenges for researchers in maintaining international collaboration during this period, especially around mobility. And I know that was a big feature of the previous session. And I just want to see if you could um, have a think about um, what innovative ways have you seen that researchers have put in place to kind of maintain their connections, maintain their international collaborations, still being able to work with all of this, even with all the disruption of COVID and the impacts on their ability to pop on a plane and, and work with a colleague overseas? Who'd like to start on that? Maybe I can well, start too I'm, long. I'm, I'm, I'm so, happy. Start with you, John. Yeah. Um, Look, I, it's, it's obviously been much easier for those that have, I think Anne alluded to it, if you've really got an established international collaboration going or you've got contacts and networks there, it's, all you have to do is to learn how, learn how to do Zoom and even someone of my age has managed to vaguely get onto Zoom. Um, so it, I think that the technology has rapidly allowed those established relationships to, to blossom. There's been no, I've not really detected no real issues in that respect at all. What worries me mostly is at the, at the earlier career level where young individual, young researchers haven't yet established those complex networks, established networks. They have to do it often through the lab head or something, but, and it is, I think someone else alluded to, it's much harder to start out when you're just zooming someone that you've never, you know, actually met, and that extends, although it's a little bit more in the medium term rather than right now, Sarah. I mean, I'm very concerned about one of the real strengths, of course, in the biomedical research area, and I'm sure it applies in other areas too, is the ability as a young postdoc to go overseas or to visit a different country, get different. You just you just grow up a lot, you know, as well as learning new ways of looking at science. You can't really do that over Zoom. Um, so I certainly hope the international travel will, uh, you know, won't be too long after the vaccines are out there because this, this really has been a great interruption to an earlier mid-career researcher in, in, in their activities. Um, 
But for established ones, I think it's fine. It's tougher on the younger, early researchers. Right, yeah, I agree completely. Jean-Pierre? Yes, uh, maybe two points. I fully agree with what has just been said. Um, <clears throat> But uh, my concern, I would uh, like to raise two concerns. Is, uh, the first one, in the case of ERC, for example, we have been able to continue our evaluation, which is a major enterprise, uh, without interruption. And this was done only uh, due to the extraordinary dedication of the staff. Because in particular, if you, are conduct, uh, if you conduct interviews, you need to be sure that the access of candidates is fair. And this needs to check and check and check uh, because you don't want to be exposed to people complaining that actually they didn't have the same uh, capacity to, to interact with the jury as others. And I think uh, you can do that and, uh, for, for a certain period of time, but uh, unless there is really much more staff, this will not be sustainable. The other point I want to make is that in the case of ERC, I, I, evaluators are coming from all around the world. So when we have, um, first of all, the meetings are longer, and, and uh, then uh, when you have people from different time zones, some people just uh, were up uh, for a full week uh, the whole night. And of course, you can do that if there is a, a catastrophe, I mean, some kind of a completely exceptional and catastrophic situation. But the idea that you can continue is, uh, is definitely not the, the, the right thing. So I think one has to be very careful to believe that the n new normal will be uh, the, what we have uh, known now. And in particular, I want to stress that for the younger people, and in particular for establishing new relations or new activities, uh, this is really very complicated, including for the panels. I mean, for panels who know each other, actually it's not so bad, but uh, our panels are always uh, changed, and uh, for good reasons, because we, we need to always bring in uh, new people. Um, that's much more difficult, because you, the, the kind of relation you develop with people just uh, seeing their faces or seeing some of their faces, because you know, none of the software allows to see all the faces at once for the moment. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's very different. So I think one has to be very careful uh, with uh, this, I, this concept, even the new normal, as if uh, what we have been going through should become just uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the future. I think uh, probably we have lessons to, to learn and for sure maybe some things we have been doing differently, we, should, we could continue to do them differently. But I think personal contact, in particular for the young people, is so decisive in shaping your uh, understanding of your field, but also your own perspectives uh, that I think, uh, I mean, still be able to move around is, is going to be very critical. And I hope we can resume this under good conditions uh, in the near future. So do we all. And of course, Dr. Finkel would always say, face to face, you have unlimited limited bandwidth for the conversation. Yeah, yeah, you, you can certainly talk face to face on the, on the video. You can't go down to the local bar and have a glass of wine and discuss the problems of the world. And I mean, so there, you know, we're, we're humans and we really do need to establish those social interactions as well as the strict professional ones. Yeah, Mary. Thank you, Sarah. Look, I think John and Jean-Pierre have, have touched on it, that it, it is different to different career stages. And I think two of the most creative things that we've seen over the last few months um, is number one, those senior researchers have stepped up to the plate and those senior researchers have actively brought introductions to the door of their postdocs, to the door of their students, because they know the students don't have the opportunity to do them themselves. But the other thing that I think matches with that, but was re it's relatively simple, it's about scheduling. But because a lot of our campuses were closed, because you know our students weren't on campus, I saw some very deliberate programs um, and communications where the senior researchers, where the research leaders had said, you know, um, Anne, John, Jean-Pierre, I would, I really want you to dial into this international conference, but I appreciate that it's from midnight till 6 a.m. Australia time. And so therefore we hereby agree that I will not see you and I do not expect to communicate with you during regular Australian business hours. Now to a student or to an early career researcher who's already quite nervous about this environment for senior people to say it's okay to switch your time zones if you can, those simple steps have actually, I think, made a huge difference because it's made it 
part of our performance. As Jean-Pierre said, it won't last forever, it really can't, um, but it is this middle phase or this next phase. But I think it's that permission from our senior experienced researchers um, that was absolutely key in, in some of those changes that we've seen in the last few months. Wonderful. And did you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, well, just to pick up on uh, Mary's comments, um, I can't add to anything that's been said about the individual experience, but I think it's very interesting to see how conferences are uh, moving into uh, the digital world. And while um, for all the reasons that John, I think, particularly articulated so well, the importance of being able to be face to face, um, uh, it's never going to be the ideal, but it really opens up possibilities for people to have access to conferences in a way that they didn't before. And um, that's going to be important for a lot of young people in our own country. I think it's incredibly important for people in lower middle income countries who can't necessarily travel to conferences uh, normally anyway for, for resource reasons. So I'm really hoping that some of what we've learned in this year is going to persist in a way that increases equity of access to uh, interaction, scientific interaction. We'll just have to get better at doing it to compensate um, for those parts that, uh, that we lose through such a process. And that segues perfectly into my next question, which is basically what would you like to see as part of the new normal in terms of international collaboration? You know, like what do we want to keep having as we come out of this pandemic and, and what are we happy to kind of let go? Um, you know, what do we need to kind of concentrate on? Jean-Pierre, would you like to start that one off? Well, um, I think uh, for sure the last point uh, which was made uh, concerning um, uh, really uh, attendance to conferences all, all around the world uh, without being physically there but uh, but uh, with people you, you you know about or you 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 know them personally or you know the topic they are discussing uh, is certainly something which is going to become uh, more uh, more uh, uh, normal or more the a new possibility which will be put uh, in the hands of, of the researchers. My difficulty with this um, in my own field, I'm a mathematician, so in the sense for mathematicians, access to lab is, is not so critical. What is uh, access is access to people, which is critical. And the only thing uh, I'm, I do have um, collaborators or people with whom I had collaborated in many parts of the world. And the difficulty now is uh, basically every day I have an offer to contribute or participate in a conference uh, in the world. So now managing this, making choices, and really probably rethinking the way you want to, to develop further, uh, probably will require some, some thought. And for the moment, it's just that the accumulation of new opportunities, which is there, but at some point one has to make it uh, really into something which makes sense. And then for sure, in terms of international collaboration, it, it needs to be coordinated or streamline in a way which is definitely uh, resp uh, respectful for a contribution from many different countries. For example, just because I, in the way I visited Australia in 2018, I visited uh, um, uh, Brazil last year, and actually uh, the Brazilians really kept me in, in the loop with some of their conferences. And I must say that uh, of the most interesting uh, conferences I could hear on modeling for the pandemic, uh, was coming from uh, from Brazil, and uh, and really and because they looked for panels which were completely international and just managed to convince some of the absolute best people in the world to contribute in also in a way which was not uh, just delivering a lecture but uh, people uh, accepting to comment on the others and so on. So it was truly interactive. So it shows that. Uh, uh, you should think of the world as, uh, I mean, uh, countries in the world as really potential contributors at the highest level. And you should not just say, well, only the big ones are going to be the ones uh, contributing. This is just wrong. So I think probably it broadens the view of international collaborations. And from that point of view, of course, it requires uh, people with uh, putting the right thought and putting the right efforts. Uh, but I think uh, this is something we have to keep in mind. Yeah, and of course, the effort that has to be there to keep these good things going, basically, that it, it doesn't kind of come straight away. We do actually have to put things in place to make that happen. Mary, did you want to reflect on this? 
Um, I think w one of the things, and we've had some very early stage conversations, um, is our new normal or, or the post-COVID. Um, there are a lot of things certainly that we need to learn. What I also think we need to reflect, um, we all know how long it takes in a research career um, to build your profile, to build your publications, to build your, you know, your career path. Um, and for over a decade, we've been talking about non-traditional paths. What I think we're in a new phase of what a career path looks like. And one of the things potentially for our early and mid-career researchers is that we're going to have to extend the clock for them. You know, we're going to have to look in a peer re review perspective or looking at promotion um, considerations or appointment considerations. We're really going to have to think. Three years, three years between 2015 and 2018 is not going to be the same as three years between 2019 and 2022. So I hope that some of the learnings that we bring, you know, coming forward from this is that we do think about what that clock actually needs to look like in order for recovery and future success and not in a decade's time still be lamenting the damage that was done in 2020. Thanks, Sarah. Great. Yeah. John? Yeah. I, yeah. I also think, just to follow up on some of those comments, that I mean, while we all agree that person-to-person uh, -person interaction is so important in developing those relationships and the careers and everything else, I think what the pandemic has done worldwide is it's, it really has accelerated the use of this sort of video technology enormously. I think, as uh, we've said, has said before, on a couple of speakers made the point, we also find with meetings now held virtually, we get a much bigger audience that we might have gotten if, if they had to travel in person to the meeting. Now, when you're 25 and 30, you want to travel, it's an adventure, it's great to go to these meetings to meet new people. When you're 65, there's a bit of hesitancy at times, whether it's, oh, I don't want to travel all that distance. And so I think what we'll find in the new norm is probably a lot more use of the technology as a sort of a hybrid thing with the person-to-person -person conferences and meetings. But I think we will use a lot more of this technology to complement that. It won't be one or the other. Um, and it's probably just, it was happening anyway, but I think it's accelerated it enormously. Yeah, agree completely on the acceleration. Uh, you know, that's amazing. Yeah. Anne? Yeah, I think um, we, we shouldn't forget how fast technology is developing. And just a few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to do this nearly as effectively as we are today. Uh, and so uh, the technology will get better and better for ha us having something more like a real world experience of meeting. Um, I've joked in the past about uh, the days when we can meet by hologram and think we can feel as if we're all around the same table. And uh, you know, maybe it's not so stupid to think about how technology will take us somewhere where we actually don't need to have an enormous carbon footprint to feel as if we're in the same space with our colleagues. You're probably right, Anne. Absolutely. Yeah. And so now some questions from the audience. So um, I, it's a quite a long question. So I'm, I, I think I might just paraphrase it in saying that um, how do we think we can build the kind of global collaborations that are needed? You know, we've talked a lot about the individual kind of collaborations, the small teams, but of course this COVID pandemic response has been underpinned by, you know, some really significant global collaborations with open data and the, the genetics and all of the things. So, you know, and of course those global collaborations are hard to kind of maintain and to set up. So, you know, what do you think in terms of that, you know, the large scale global collaborations and, and, and how they will be going forward in a post-COVID world. I might start with it. you this time, Anne. What do you think? Because, of course, the NHMRC has those, you know, memberships of some quite significant global collaborations, as you outlined in your initial statement. Yeah, so I think that some of those co-funding arrangements obviously are a bit of a stimulus to collaboration, but uh, we don't find that Australian researchers... Um, necessarily need that to collaborate. We have lots of uh, international collaborators um, for our normal grant schemes as well. So I think the desire is there. Uh, sometimes having a push or having a, a fund, extra funding source is a good way of cementing such a relationship. Um, I think what's uh, really important is to um, understand our mutual benefit. And uh, that's partly about us showing that we are good collaborators, that we need to be generous, open, data sharing, 
good friends as collaborators so that people will want to collaborate with us so that Australians will be seen as uh, good collaborators, which I think on the whole they have been um, over the decades. But it's very important to think about how our reputations um, are so important to invite collaboration. Uh, I also think uh, we have to think about what we bring that's particularly special. And uh, so, you know, the way we behave in the world is incredibly important. But at the moment, I think there are also some special opportunities that come from Australia being a low COVID nation, and we should build on those opportunities. We have a population, unlike most advanced countries of the world, we now have a population where very few people have been exposed. It's the perfect environment uh, to do some really important vaccine and infection and immunity studies, as well as analyses of um, how to best control clusters of infections. And I'd really like us to think about what we at the moment can draw on as being our special contribution to our global research that will help to build our value for the future. Wonderful, because of course, you know, our ability to test new therapeutics and kind of be part of those clinical trials is of course a bit limited by the lack of COVID cases, so swings and roundabouts. Um, John, would you want to reflect on this one? Yeah, look, I, I think it's, um, I think the challenge, Sarah, is that it's, I mean, collaboration sort of between countries and things like that, if they're just forced down from the top, are artificial and don't really work. I, I personally believe it comes down to providing incentives, and, and as Dan's mentioned, several of them, and all the academies of science around the world have various um, scholarships and fellowships with between you know, researchers from different countries to encourage that interaction. But I think what we need to do as much as possible, facilitate that interaction at that small personal level, because then it grows into something bigger. Um, and it can only really happen, of course, when the country, as Anne said, when there's something in it for everyone, if you're talking about a bigger level. And so I, that's why we, I'm particularly pleased that Australia's now got a space agency so that will enhance our collaboration in that area or our potential to do that with various other countries, which when we had a lot of scattered good space researchers, there wasn't so much that, a, that catalyst for that sort of collaboration and interaction. So look, it's, it's multifaceted, but I think it really is driven by people at the end, uh, end of the day. And we all know that with the best of intentions, you may have want to develop certain large collaborative arrangements with different countries, but then the politicians in that country change, change and uh, the whole landscape changes. So it's down to people again. Absolutely. And of course, of course, those, you know, local focuses of effort really do help in having these international collaborations at times, don't they? I think, you know, certainly our research infrastructure investments, I think, have benefited from having, you know, kind of national facilities that can have conversations internationally with like, like facilities. Well, as, as, I, as, I, as I, we mentioned before, I think the, uh, despite the dramas of the, the, of the pandemic, I mean, I think every cloud has a silver lining and I really do hope that it's forced a lot of global interaction to occur at a rate that would not normally have occurred and we can build on that and this is not just in academia or, or government research i mean i'm i'm sure you well you're well aware that um csl one of australia's major biopharmaceutical companies has a very close collaboration with astrazeneca now um, in making that vaccine they've scaled up already it's already sort of happening but industry across the board in different countries is also seen the opportunity for collaboration because they need each other in that particular sense. So I just think that it, it you know, COVID-19 may, I hope, will act as a catalyst to increase this international interaction. Mm. Jean-Pierre? Well, uh, if you allow me to, to, to say that uh, maybe we, as scientists, we really have to stress more than we have been doing so far that uh, in science, competition, collaboration is a, a, a normal situation, but it doesn't mean that we are considering the people with whom we are competing uh, as enemies. And uh, un unfortunately, uh, I think uh, the, the tendency, and I'm afraid that the economic crisis, which will come out of the COVID crisis, could exacerbate some of the tensions between the countries. And we have seen some of that already with a typically the, the policy, American policy with, under the present president. And, and I think uh, we as scientists have to really make the point that for us, 
uh, it was very well said, extremely very well, uh, extremely well by John, that really science is a, a common public good, and, and therefore even when we are competing, uh, it's uh, we compete with respect, and we know that the breakthroughs can come from many different places, and and that we we really want to this uh, collaboration to be established uh, without. Uh, uh, one dominating the other, even if we know that the, the, the situation is not equal and they are really uh, countries which are making better investments at better structures, but still uh, we should be in this spirit. And I think as scientists, we probably will have to make the point uh, much more forcefully that we have done so far. Wonderful. And Mary, do you want to kind of have the final word? I think we're almost out of time. Oh, no pressure, Sarah. Thank you. Um, look, I think <laughs> I think it has been touched on in a number of ways, but um, the mutual benefit that Anne referred to, um, and also in one aspect, um, we are you know a potentially fantastic location for some testing. But I think also we have to make sure we don't fall foul of assuming that the COVID experience was the same everyone in every country and every community. And I think there's huge potential for mutual gain, respectful research steps forward um, when we respect the fact that the experiences have been very different and are likely to continue to be different. So there's a lot that we can learn um, across that global community. Um, if we can just have those existing connections, take that leap and keep the conversations going. Thank Wonderful. You, thank you. So I just thank all the panellists. This has been a really great session exploring, you know, how we can be stronger together now and into the future in the post-COVID world. So I'll hand back to Nishant. Thank you very much to all the panellists and to the audience. Thank you, thank Sarah. You. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Anne. Bye-bye. Yeah,